So the title of my message is Being Filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's a subject that's very close to my heart. Being filled with the Holy Spirit absolutely and completely changed my life. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. And it really did completely, radically change me from a very staid, can I say, um, conservative Catholic boy to a person that was radically changed for Jesus Christ. And so the, the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, I remember that I, and I've shared this before, that I went along to a prayer meeting where the guy said, you want to just, uh, one of my close mates, and now here he is, 40 years later, still one of my closest mates. He actually is my closest mate. And he said to me, do you want to come to a meeting? He didn't tell me it was a prayer meeting. He didn't tell me any of that. And I went along and they prayed for an hour in tongues praying in the language of the Holy Spirit for an hour. And I'm just standing there gobsmacked. Uh, couldn't understand a word they were saying. They were incredibly excited. They were jumping around the room. They were singing. They were clapping. They were praising. They were doing all of those things. And then when they kind of died down after about an hour, uh, I just said, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's, that's all I said. Oh, well, I want what you've got. You know the commercial? I want what you get. You know that one? And uh, I want what you're having. And... So they just said to me, are you born again? I said, no, I'm not. So uh, I asked Jesus into my heart there and then, and then they prayed over me and I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And it, it just completely changed my outlook. It completely changed my relationship with Jesus Christ. It completely changed the way that I read the Word of God. I was given a good news Bible and it was just the New Testament, red and white. I've still got it. Uh, and was given to her by one of my close mate's mothers. She said, here, you'll need this. And I just read that. I devoured that book. It's got dog-eared corners and pages that are written on and all that sort of stuff because Jesus came into my heart in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said to us, uh, look, you, I'm, I'm going to the Father. You need to wait here for the promise. You need to wait here for the Holy Spirit because you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so when that took place in my heart, it, it was completely radically changed, not just the way I walked, not just the way I walked with Jesus uh, because I was very devout, but it changed the way that I read the Word of God. It changed the way I interact with my family. It changed the way that I interacted with my friends. I remember sitting on the bus and saying, who can I witness to next? And that's what the Holy Spirit does when it fills us. And so tonight we're going to look at how are we filled with the Holy Spirit. Secondly, we're going to look at what does that mean for you and I in our day-to-day -day lives. So let's read from Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. It's a very familiar verse. I read it a few weeks back. And so what we have been talking about is the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand that the Holy Spirit is not an abstract force. The Holy Spirit is not an ethereal, mystical thing. The Holy Spirit is mysterious, but not mystical. And we need to understand the difference because uh, I was talking to a lady a while back and she was talking about Christian crystals. And she spent 20 minutes talking to me about Christian crystals and about how these crystals, because the Holy Spirit was over them and, and she'd got a hanky from the United States. And I won't say the, the um, particular person's name, but I think you know who I'm talking about. And she bought this hanky for a nice donation of $25 and she put this hanky on the crystals and so these crystals now had power. And, uh, and I, know I just said, look, I don't, I don't think I agree with you. Uh, just <laughs> doesn't quite fit with, it's not the words I use, but it doesn't, didn't quite fit with my theology around the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit's not a force. It's not an abstract thing that resides in, in, in a place or a temple or a church or a synagogue or, or an idol. The Holy Spirit is a person. How do we know the Holy Spirit's a person? Because the Holy Spirit is, can be grieved. The Holy Spirit has emotions. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit has the character and nature of God. And so the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was there at creation. And Pastor Anna shared about creation from Genesis 1.1. The Holy Spirit was brooding upon the waters, it says in Genesis 1.1. So the Holy Spirit was present at creation. The Holy Spirit was present when Jesus was conceived in the Virgin Mary. Because the archangel uh, Gabriel came to Mary and said, You have been... Uh, conceived, what is in you has been conceived of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was there when Jesus was literally began. And one of the things that I love about the Chinese, the nation of China, is they recognize the birthday from when, not from when they're born, but from when their life started. And that's what they do. They recognize that your life starts when you're conceived, not when you're born. So they're, they're nine months 
and then it's three, and that's one year. I think that's, that, that's how it works. That's what I've read anyway. So um, it's really wonderful that the Holy Spirit, so that's the work of the Holy Spirit. The, the other work of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit intercedes for us by name. So that, so that when the Holy Spirit is interceding for Pastor Anna, he says, I'm interceding for Anna Button right now, Nika Pekin, in Jesus' name, just in case the heavenlies forget her maiden name. And so the Holy Spirit intercedes for her and intercedes for you by name. So when we're at that point where we can't pray, the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf. And then, of course, then we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit is released the power of the Holy Spirit is demonstrated when the gospel is preached. So if we read through the book of Acts, and we use the book of Acts as a template, every time the gospel was preached, the Holy Spirit was made manifest. And we're going to read in a, in a second exactly how that works. And so today we're talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will radically change your life. It will radically change your relationship with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will fill you with joy. So there are emotions that come when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, but the emotion isn't the Holy Spirit. You don't need the emotion to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a sign, oh, I must be filled with the Holy Spirit because the hair stood up on the back of my neck. Well, no, sometimes I'm filled with the Holy Spirit when I feel nothing at all. And yet the experience varies from time to time, but there's... An indwelling. So when we give our hearts to Jesus, there's an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So John's, in John's Gospel, Jesus is having a conversation late at night when it's dark with a, a person, a Pharisee called Nicodemus. And Nicodemus came and he's talking to Jesus and they're talking back and forth. And then Jesus said to him this, you must be born again. And Nicodemus goes, how can you enter a second time into your mother's womb? And Jesus said, no, 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 that's born of the water. You must be born of water and born of the Spirit. And so what Jesus is telling Nicodemus, who later, of course, once Jesus was crucified, he was one of the men that came to get Jesus' body with Joseph. And so Nicodemus, he said to him, you must be born of water and born of the Spirit. So when we ask Jesus into our heart, when we ask Jesus into our life, the Holy Spirit indwells, lives in us, resides in us. So it's interesting, many years ago, Star Wars 2, The Empire Strikes Back. It's my favourite Star Wars movie. So I'm assuming everyone has at least seen a trailer of Star Wars. If, if you haven't watched, there's 15 movies now of Star Wars and 37 series uh, talk, about, <laughs> talk about milking a good thing. They really knew how to extract every ounce of dollar out of that particular franchise. But in the second Star Wars, Yoda and Luke. So Luke's this guy on a quest. He's been told by Obi-Wan Kenobi, Ben Kenobi, you need to, you need to find Yoda on the, uh, on the planet of Tatooine. Tatooine? No, not Tatooine. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Sorry? Dagobah. Anyway, all of these Star Wars freaks will be sitting there on YouTube going, no, it's this, it's this, it's this. I need to write in. That's, the, that's the, the planet that he went to. Anyway, Luke and Yoda are there and Yoda's hiding away and he's got a walking stick and he talks backwards uh, in Latin and everything else, talks in Latin um, phraseology. And then he says, the force, the force, it's in you. It's, it's the force is in the trees and it's in the rocks. It's everywhere. And of course, that's Zen Buddhism. That's not. And a lot of Christians think of the Holy Spirit as an abstract force that lives in everything. Now, the Holy Spirit is in all, through all, and over all, but doesn't live in a rock, doesn't live in a place. It lives in us. And so we need to understand that the Holy Spirit's not a force, but a person. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit from the moment that we accept Jesus into our hearts, is constant. That never changes. We, we, we read about this in Romans chapter 8, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. So when, when we ask Jesus into our heart, we're born of the Spirit, and it resides in our heart, and then it stays there. And that's, that indwelling of the Holy Spirit is constant. The filling of the Holy Spirit 
changes with ebbs and flows as we go along in our walk with Jesus. Let's read from Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Now, in other versions it says, and they were praying together in one place. I've, I've bought myself a new Bible, and it's, it's, a, it's an NIV that's from 20-something or other. And some of the things are slightly changed, and some of the language is changed around male and female sense. So I'm big on Scripture saying what Scripture says. And so uh, we just need to understand when we're buying our Bibles that we choose carefully and choose wisely. So because it actually says when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together praying in one place. Suddenly a sound came like the blowing of a violent wind from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And so we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is described as a few things. There's a few things that describe the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is a dove. It's like a dove. So when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove. And Jesus, the Holy Spirit is also described as oil and water. And here we read that the Holy Spirit is described as wind and fire. It doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is wind. It's like wind. It doesn't mean it is fire. It's like fire. So they're descriptions that bring about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And so they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's flick across to chapter 4 of Acts. So what we're doing is we're just seeing the... the what Luke is laying out for us. And if you work your way through Acts, you see this time and time again. So Peter and John had been arrested. They'd been arrested. They'd been questioned. Uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were unhappy. The Sanhedrin was unhappy. They're saying, you've just got to stop talking about this Jesus guy all the time. And then they came back and came back to their fellow believers. And in verse 29, they said this, Now, Lord, consider their threats. And enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we speak the word of God with great boldness. So how are we filled with the Holy Spirit? We're about to find out. Stretch out your hand to heal. So the filling of the Holy Spirit comes with signs and wonders and miracles. The proclamation of the gospel brings about the filling of the Holy Spirit and brings about the signs and wonders. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Now you'll find this through several other times in the book of Acts where it talks about they were in a place praying and then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it was evidence with speaking in other tongues and sometimes it wasn't. But it always describes that the filling of the Holy Spirit is something that ebbs and flows in our walk with Jesus. And so what would you think would be the ideal frequency that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit? I'm not asking that as a question for a response. But yes, obviously, every day. And how are we filled with the Holy Spirit? By praying. And so one of the things that I've noticed in COVID, and I don't know if you've noticed this as, as well, but uh, at the start of COVID, some people really took to it and just loved it. They loved not having to travel to work. They loved not having to spend a couple of hours each day on the commute to and from. And there's a guy who's a Hindu, and he told me there's a Hindu that's at the school next door, and I meet him because we wait for our kids. And he was telling me that, before his kids went back to school, it was really hard for him. He was getting up at 5 and going to bed at 11 because he was having to educate his kids through the day. As soon as they were up, he had no time. They gave him no peace and he had to wait for his wife to get home from work before he could start the work again. So his days were long and that was tough. Then they went back to school and that was a big <gasps> breathe a sigh of relief. But then he found that he was working longer hours. So even though because he wasn't driving to work anymore, he could work more. And his boss was very happy that he was working more. And one of the things that he said to me is that they now have four hours per week where they meet together. And he said, those four hours are so good. I'm seeing people again. I'm seeing adults again. You're not allowed to shake hands or do any of that stuff. But just being in the room with another group of people is just such a wonderful thing. And I'm, this is just my own observation. But I think that people are a little bit people-starved. One of the things that people long for 
is connection and community. And the very thing that the COVID restrictions detach us from is connection and community. And I was at an Australian Rules football game, well, four games yesterday. I was at three of them. And people were not obeying social distancing rules, let me tell you. So there's two guys that I know, I've known them for four or five years on and off because they're part of a football club. You get to know guys. I'm a referee, Australian Rules umpire. And so you get to know blokes. G'day, how are you going? And there's two blokes going up gave each other a great big hug and held on for a little bit longer than normal. It wasn't just a hug and a slap on the back. It's, mate, how are you going? been so long since I've seen you. And I'm thinking, okay, there's crosses on the ground, uh, 1.5 metres apart. Uh, you're not quite really following the rules there. But what I'm finding is that people are starving for that connection and community. Yeah. And this, my Indian friend from next door was saying the same thing, that there was, there was a real loss in of sense of community with his co-workers he said even the ones I don't get on well with it was still good to see them because they could just see some other people have some conversations go to the water cooler go to and get coffee and, and whatever and so it's that longing for belonging Telstra used to have their their thing at the moment of uh, belong and different things and, and connection and community are, are the words that are being used a lot and yet we need to understand as Christians we need to understand that we've got to reach into that space because we need to find new and different and innovative ways to create connection and community with one another. It's something that's really uh, important and laid on my heart by, by Jesus is that we need to connect and create opportunities for community with one another. There are restrictions around how we meet. There's in Victoria at the moment, everyone, you cannot go outside without a mask. Simply can't go outside. It's a $200 fine. If you go out of your home, even if you walk to your car, you go out of your home and you don't have a mask on, it's a $200 on-the-spot fine. And so that's what's happening just on our neighbouring state, just to the south. And so there has been talk also that this may be introduced into New South Wales. We're not sure what's up ahead for us in that space. But that's just a further break. Can you imagine if I was up here tonight having to preach with a mask on? I would feel really self-conscious. Um, so some people would be really comfortable with a mask, but I wouldn't because it, it feels like it'd be cutting me off, cutting me off from everybody else. We've got to stand 1.5 metres apart. We have to have a mask on. We can't shake hands. You can't make contact. Do you understand what I'm saying? So back in World War II, just post-World War II, when the Iron Curtain was drawn across Eastern Europe, uh, which formed the Soviet bloc, 17 Soviet satellite states were formed, with Russia being the motherland and all speaking Russian. And in Romania, there was a, uh, an orphanage there where the babies were cared for. They had enough food, they had enough water, they had, the temperature was good, they had bedding and everything else, but they didn't touch the babies at all. No contact with the babies because they're orphans. They're not sure. They're kind of the outcasts of society. Within a couple of months, those babies were dying like flies. And the reason is no human contact. Uh, psychologists actually describe, they call it skin food. That when we, sh if we just shake hands, there's, there's an exchange that takes place. And obviously, this is why the COVID restrictions are there, because there's not just an exchange that takes place in terms of germs or bacteria from one to another, but there's an exchange that takes place from one person to another. And it's called skin food. And so that when we do clasp hands, or when we do put our amber in, now Anna's not here right now, so I used her as a prop this morning, but she's disappeared for a bit. But um, uh, that skin food is so important to us as people. Uh, as people, we absolutely crave connection and community. In, I was reading from Richard Wormbrand's writings, who wrote the book, he was in Romania, wrote the book Torture for Christ. The prisoners used to tap with their cups on the wall and they had their own system of the alphabet so that they could talk to one another and that message would go all around through the prison. They'd all talk to the next, next person in the next cell all the way around and they could communicate and create this own sense of community and connection in a prison cell where in then complete and utter isolation. And they craved for that time on each day where they'd talk to each other, the tap, tap, tap on the wall. Because it's connection and community. And one of the things that's happened is we need as Christians is we need to pray into that space and create opportunities for connection and community. So can I challenge you? So in a moment, what we're going to do is this. 
Uh, so first we prayed about how we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We're filled with the Holy Spirit in prayer. My experience with the Holy Spirit is this. I find that when I come to church on a Sunday or go to a connect group meeting on a Wednesday or go to a prayer meeting on a Wednesday or a prayer meeting on a Monday or a Tuesday morning, there's a, another guy and I have met together for the last five and a half years. Every Tuesday morning we pray at seven o'clock. I put it at seven o'clock because I thought he was a morning person. He came at seven o'clock because he thought I was a morning person. Neither of us are morning people. And so isn't that amazing? And yet we discovered that in those times where we're praying, the Holy Spirit would come and it would be an unbelievable sense of the presence of God. So we are filled with the Holy Spirit when we pray. We're filled with the Holy Spirit when we come to church and worship. One of the things that's been taken away from us as believers in the short term is the ability and capacity to sing and praise and worship Jesus Christ. And I long for the day when the songs of praise will rise again from the shores of Australia. I long for the day when Christians can gather together and sing and worship to their Saviour. I long for the day when they'll raise their voice and lift their hands in worship to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and shout out, Without any fear or any trepidation, they'll shout out the glory, wonder, and majesty of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Yes. And so in worship, we need to engage in a different way. So Sophie did an incredible job up here, but singing all alone. And so, so when, when we're in that mode of worship, because it's worship, you just turning up tonight is worship. It is. It really is. And standing here during worship and raising your hands, that's worship. When you brought your offering, that was worship. And so what we need to understand is that we need to engage in worship. So when the, the worship team are up here singing, we can pray, we can speak the words, not sing the words, but we can sing the words that are on the screen afterwards and speak that out and engage in worship. to our, And that's what I've been doing the whole time since COVID has really been introduced the COVID restrictions have been introduced so that's how we're filled with the Holy Spirit now what do we do with it well we're going to deal with something first what I want us to do is to is to pray the Holy Spirit comes upon us in such mighty and powerful ways the Holy Spirit is here right now right here with us the Holy Spirit wants to speak to people and wants to speak through people. And so in a little bit, I'm just going to ask uh, maybe Amy, only because you did it this morning, if you can jump up and sing what you sang this morning. And I, I want us, as Amy's singing it, I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 6 and verse 24. Because in Numbers chapter 6 and tw verse 24, it says this, it's, it's used as a benediction. So a benediction is something that comes at the end of something. And Numbers is not exactly the, the whole book of cheer up. It's, it's, not a, it's the book of really the failings of Israel after Mount Sinai. And it's the 40 years or well, that, that time period of thereabouts where Jesus was allowing all, where, sorry, God the Father was allowing all of the Israelites that were disobedient, that weren't going to enter the promised land, that were basically dying off. And here's this little gem, poetic gem, written by Moses in the middle of the start of the book of Numbers where it says this. The Lord bless you. <laughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So in this particular passage, as Amy's going to sing it, I want us to read that. We're going to flick the words up. So I know that I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and then read the words, so please don't get too confused about all of that. But uh, if you can do that, you really are full of the Holy Spirit. So, But I want us to meditate on these words. One of the things that we don't do is we don't meditate on the Holy Spirit. We call out to Him. We pray. We ask Him. And we meditate on the Word and then the Holy Spirit reveals that to us. So as Amy sings this, I want us to... You can close your eyes. You can turn there to Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26 and read it. 
and then close your eyes and just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. So, Amy, take us away. The Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. boldness to speak the word of God. It gives us boldness to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. It gives us boldness to share our story with those that we know. What I want to do now is challenge you to do something this week. I want you to ring up one person this week. Oh, okay, wow. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's just speaking to me now that this this depth of connection must reach past the surface, must reach past the, the veneer that's on the outside of us and reach into people's hearts. And it's the connection of the hearts. 
It's the connection of the, of the spirits, and not in a mystical, ethereal way, but in a real and personal way, because we serve our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He talks about, Paul talks about the family. Talk, Paul talks about the family. And in the book of Revelation, it talks about the, the bride, the bride of Christ. Christ makes us one in a way that we will never, ever experience in any other way, shape or form. And so this week, I want you to ring up a person. So Matt, uh, God's just speaking to me that uh, there'll be two or three people for you because God's going to just speak to you really clearly. And so when he nudges you, just ring them up straight away. This is what we need to do when we ring them up. Can I pray for you? Offer to pray for them. Whether they're a Christian or a non-Christian, I've found often if you offer to pray for someone, even if they're not a Christian, they'll normally go, okay, what can it hurt? And they normally say yes, unless you're, of course, with, with an atheist. I've got a friend who's an atheist. He said, pray what you like. doesn't make any difference to me, but if that makes you feel better, go your hardest. So he's still not saying no, is he? Uh, and the other thing that I've noticed is there's no atheists in foxholes. So when we ring them up, we're going to offer to pray for them. So sometimes God may give you a word. So look that word up and go, look, God's laid a word on my heart. Can I share that word with you and then pray for you? So I'm challenging you to ring up someone this week. We need to find ways and create connection and community amongst us. So Matt, you're going to have two or three. God's just going to speak to you there and then and bang it'll be and bring them up. So that'll be really wonderful. That's what we do when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We proclaim the Word of God. Now, turning just finally to Acts chapter 7. I want us to read from there. And we talk about, read about the story of Stephen. So what had happened is that Stephen in verse, we're going to read from verse 53 of Acts chapter 7. And Stephen says to them, This you have received the law that was given through the angels, but you have not obeyed it. So Stephen's before the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are there, and they're really angry with him. And he's telling them that they're a bunch of, a, what does he call them, a stiff-necked people? And your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. That's a way to win over a crowd. But Stephen was just uh, said it without fear or favor. And when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand. And so we see here that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we declare the Word of God boldly. And so what we can do this week is create community and connection by ringing one another up. There's lots and lots of different ways to do it. We can still have coffees. That's great. We can still have a meet here in church, and that's great. We can On social media, we can contact each other. We can Zoom one another. We can FaceTime one another. We can, there's lots of different ways. So this week, I want you to... Allow Jesus to lay one person on your heart and then you contact him in the way that he tells you to and then create community in that way.